satellite-based internet service initiative. There are three parts to this little presentation. There's a project description, the scope, and the benchmarks. And there are Starlink internet services details. I'll do that before the videos so that we don't have to interrupt the presentation. And I have put credits in the images themselves just in case there's ever any question. So uh, first of all, we have, uh, the first update is that SpaceX confirms that the Starlight I, Starlink internet private beta is underway. There's low latency and download speeds of up to 100 Mbps. And by the way, this dish antenna that's shown may be a bit larger than people will need. I don't think it's going to be as large as uh, the dishes you have for, uh, say, the AT&T services now. I, Spacelink's, I gotta move something. There we go. Spacelink's I service, I, SpaceX's service has demonstrated latency low enough to allow it to play the fastest multiplayer networked online games, which is pretty good. And it has also shown download speeds in excess of 100 megabits per second, which uh, is fast enough to stream multiple HD video streams at once. So everybody in the house can watch whatever their favorite streaming service is. Uh, Starlink's goal is to leapfrog what's out there already with its low Earth orbit constellation, which has the advantage of transmitting its signal much closer into the Earth than the far out geostationary satellites that provide legacy networking capabilities. Also, this has an effect on latency, and we'll see that satellite to satellite communication is important in that also. I, Spacelink, uh, SpaceX recently completed its first inter-satellite link between the Starlink spacecraft. Now this allows them to transfer hundreds of gigabytes of data between satellites via optical laser. So that if you're on one side of the earth and the upload, the uplink is on the other side of the earth, it can go between the satellites in order to get to your downlink. And this happens at speeds that will be the fastest available anywhere for inter-satellite communication, and they're going to need it. This last feature is necessary to allow these handoffs to occur. So how good is the performance, and why does this matter to us? I, we are going to see in one of the videos the launch, which I, is the September 3rd launch, in which uh, SpaceX launched 60 Starlink internet satellites at a time. And uh, they really did stick the rocket landing, although uh, they didn't quite get the fairing catch uh, exactly right, and we'll see that also. Bob. And, yes. Is this the story that I read a few weeks ago where I think it may have been NASA was complaining about how many satellites uh, were being put up by Musk? We'll get to that. It's actually astronomers. It's the Astronomers Union. Okay. And we'll get to what the problem is. That's a couple of slides down. I can't wait for the uh, commercial airline industry to start playing Frogger with these things. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Could happen. <laughs> anyway. Uh, it could happen accidentally once they get uh, regular uh, tourist travel up to the space station. I, a two-stage Falcon 9 rocket carrying a full load of 60 Starlink satellites lifted off at 8.46 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time from Pad 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The booster's first stage came back to Earth about nine minutes after launch. We'll see that. And it landed on one of SpaceX's drone ships in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, the ones that catch the booster rocket aren't really very interesting in their names, but the ones that catch the fairings have some interesting names. I, this was the third attempt to get this particular mission off the ground because they had had weather and data review delays. SpaceX had initially planned to conduct a launch doubleheader on August 30th, which was a Sunday, with two different Falcon 9s launching from the company's Florida base pads on the same day. That would have been a first for a spaceflight company. Sooner or later, they're going to actually pull that off, but not during summer thunderstorm season, I don't think. 
So uh, photographers had only a small window of time to set up cameras so as not to interfere with pre-launch activities. Unfortunately for both the Starlink setup and the mission, weather officers detected lightning around the launch pad at launch time, even when they succeeded. And they couldn't permit anybody to be outside. So cameras weren't set up where they wanted them to be. I, this is the second reuse of this particular booster. Approximately nine minutes after liftoff, the first stage made another landing, touching down on the deck of the SpaceX drone ship, which uh, has an interesting uh, name. Actually, this, uh, this one that catches the first stage does have an interesting name. It's called, Of Course I Still Love You. And the landing marked the 60th recovery of a Falcon first stage. Earlier this year, SpaceX upgraded its second drone ship, just read the instructions, I love that ship's name, <laughs> and started using it to help catch boosters out in the ocean. I think what they mean is, uh, yeah, this is the second ship that catches the booster, as indicated in the illustration. They also have ships that catch the fairings. Uh, and we'll see eventually what the fairings are. They just, it's a covering that goes over the satellites while they're being sent up so that they don't get damaged during launch. So, I, including the 60 satellites that SpaceX launched on this mission, which is the 12th Starlink flight since May 2019, SpaceX has delivered more than 700 of the internet beaming satellites into space. I, Elon Musk has said that there need to be between 500 and 800 satellites in orbit before service can begin to roll out. So uh, they've had to push back the start date a little bit. The US Federal Communications Commission granted SpaceX approval to launch as many as 12,000 Starlink satellites. Here's where you're gonna get into problems with uh, other things that might be up there and with astronomy. Uh, they wanted to launch them into- Is there yeah. also an issue of how long a satellite can stay up in, this, in low Earth orbit? before falling back to Earth and possibly causing other problems. True, unless they have a fuel supply or can be resupplied. I, I haven't seen in the articles I've read any mention of what their plans are about that. But I, as many as 12,000, which would provide customers with high speed, low latency internet. And yeah, if some of these start coming down, there could be a problem. Now the astronomers, John, are not pleased with the numbers, 12,000 satellites. It interferes with their work by creating artificial stars, bright spots in the sky. And from ground-based astronomy, that's a disaster if you have thousands and thousands of these. Uh, they've offered to put visors on them, but the astronomers still are skeptical. And I think they may have some reason to be. In advance of rolling out its internet service, SpaceX has started offering prospective users the chance to test out its Starlink network before commencing the commercial service. Selected users have already started beta testing the service now, but many more satellites could end up launching before Musk and SpaceX will connect the whole world. Okay, so uh, there are fairing recovery efforts, which I believe is one of my videos, yes. And SpaceX, and uh, here's what the thing is about the fairings. SpaceX wants to recover the fairings because they have a fair amount of cost if you have this many rockets. And they need to limit the exposure of the fairings to seawater so as to be able to reuse this critical piece of hardware more times. So there are two ships normally per, uh, deployed per launch. But if you have dual launches, you actually have to deploy the ships a little differently. The ships had to be split up. So uh, Gomez Chief was able to scoop up both pieces of the fairings that they were after out of the ocean. Now that means they had to get them out of the ocean, which means they did not catch them in their onboard nets. And uh, they were able to safely deliver them back to the SpaceX facilities. And then the vessel headed back out to sea to join its partner vessel already stationed out in the Atlantic and awaiting the next recovery. All the recoveries, some of which were catches in nets, some of which were scoops out of the water, were expected to occur 
about 40 minutes after liftoff. And again, as we will see, the nets are supposed to be able to directly catch the ferrets to limit their exposure to seawater. So how well does the service perform? And what financial incentives does Starlink expect to receive? What will be the cost and benefits to users? We saw in my previous 5G update that there are two very different markets for high-speed internet services in the US right now. There are urban markets which require high-density, low-latency antennas with low power per antenna. Then there are the rural areas. These require a broad area, low-density antennas with much more power per antenna. I, a company called Starry is now providing urban areas with fixed wireless 5G internet services using rooftop antennas to send and receive signals between buildings. I, Starry is already in Cambridge and Somerville today. But in rural areas, there are no existing rooftops. So big towers have to be built. This is expensive. And in underserved countries and regions like in Asia and Africa, remote locations present terrestrial tower builders with very difficult challenges. So Starlink is designed to bridge these gaps and allow everyone on earth high speed internet access at affordable prices. Although what we call affordable is subject to questions and there might also be some subsidies. To help with costs, our own FCC has our rural digital Opportunity Fund, RDOF. To qualify for inclusion, Starlink must meet certain performance goals that have to do with download speeds and latency standards. I think we've all run speed tests on our internet services, so we have an idea of what speed generally means and how this affects what you can transmit and receive. Latency is what happens when there is a lag between when the signal is sent and when it is received. This differs from lag, which is the difference between when the audio part of a video signal is decoded and when the video part comes through. Lag is much more annoying than latency, although latency can cause stuttering and interruption of videos. The importance of latency is familiar to gamers and people who stream videos. You don't want too much delay between your actions, say a mouse click, and the response, which will be a game move. Acceptable broadband internet has the following specs, which is the FCC minimum for RDOF. The FCC wants to be able to promise one gigabyte per second, or gigabit actually, they're bits. One gigabit per second. Now I will see that SpaceX has a ways to go. Uh, SpaceX must also demonstrate that signals sent through its Starlink satellites must have less than 100 milliseconds of latency which is pretty good even for ground-based services. Starlink is currently, however, nowhere near these numbers, although they are under, one, uh, under 100 milliseconds of latency. So far, results show that Starlink users can expect internet download speeds, and this was August of this year, of from 11 megabits per second to 60 megabits per second. That's rather variable depending on where you are and other things, and upload speeds of five megabits per second to 18 megabits per second. In any internet service, you're apt to can have you uploads. Those, can what? you put those numbers uh, in, in some sort of a context? Because I don't have a feel for what that would allow or would not allow. OK, my Comcast internet is 250 megabits per second. I dial up tends to be under 10 megabits per second. And I, I think in order to get Zoom to work, for example, really nicely, we need speeds of 50 megabits per second. And it's recommended to have 100. So uh, in other words, what Starlink offers today, for Zoom, it might be barely adequate. Now, uh, unless you have files, you don't have equal upload and download. And when you're streaming something both ways, like Zoom, it's your upload speed that's going to be a limiting factor. And uh, five to 18 megabits per second is considerably slower than say Comcast, which has anywhere from 20 to 50, which is adequate for Zoom. 
uh, the latency from Starlink is anywhere from 31 mega, uh, milliseconds to 94 milliseconds. At 94 um, milliseconds, Bob? yeah. Um, just yeah. To give me a, get, just to give me a feel for this, um, at the altitudes of these satellites, how long does it take from, for a signal to get from the satellite to Earth? You know that? The latency, the latency refers to the time it takes for the signal to travel one direction from satellite to Earth. Yeah, I understand. So that's in milliseconds. Yeah, okay. But so you're saying, but they have to be less than what? Less than 100 milliseconds? They have to be less than 100 milliseconds. But to get decent high, de high definition video streaming, we're aiming at 20 milliseconds. Currently, Starlink is down to 31 to 94 milliseconds. Why is this so variable? Because latency is much more dependent on conditions and other esoteric things than the general speed. Latency is much more sensitive than speed to fluctuations in any conditions. So did that answer the question to some extent? Okay. I, so guess, I, I guess so. All right. I, so, it's so I ask, latency is not just a function of the round trip time for the signal, right? Or, or the one way trip time. Because uh, the, the low Earth orbit, they're at like within 300 miles. Yeah. So that's much less than a millisecond, I think. Yes. I, processing within the satellite that add to latency. Correct, right. correct. There is processing that goes on. I, I, you're correct, Ken. I, the processing is actually the majority of the time that it takes. If you transfer from satellite to satellite, each time the signal goes through, it has to be processed. And satellite to Earth, it has to be processed for the uplink and it has to be processed for the downlink. And I, that processing in 5G internet is very significant because if you're going to push processing from the central uh, cloud out to the edge of the network for so-called edge processing, and you can't get much farther to the edge than a satellite, you have to have enough power, enough processing power there, and a good enough processor to be able to deliver a fast processing, which would reduce it from 31 milliseconds down to 20 milliseconds or less. And that's really fast processing. But the 94 milliseconds, that is dependent on conditions. And uh, there are various kinds of conditions it depends on. I suppose also it depends on how many satellites the signal is handed off to you, because it may originate far from your region, which would mean that it goes through more satellites. So Ken, maybe that's uh, what they're getting at with, uh, with the processing more than it is with the uh, length of time that the signal takes. Okay, thanks for the correction. But everybody's internet service will vary on latency measures. It depends on how many hops it takes, how busy the network is, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, Bob, just for uh, argument's sake, I just did speed test on my phone, uh, yeah. disconnected from my Wi-Fi, and I got 12, 27 milliseconds uh, for, for a ping test, which I believe is the latency that you're talking about. Uh, ping and latency, technically they're different, but you're close enough. And uh, yes, that is actually not really good, but not really bad for right. a ground-based internet service. However, you're going through your phone and that's uh, another device and so on and so forth. So we don't know if that's the raw speed. When I did, did Wi-Fi in the house, I had like five milliseconds. Five milliseconds is really good. It's adequate for several people doing HD streaming exactly. at the same time. Whereas uh, I downgraded my service and I probably have a ping of anywhere from 10 to, well, about 10 milliseconds. So again, the satellite is not as good as ground-based, especially not Fios. Fios has the lowest ping of anybody. Just point of reference, that's all. Yeah, good. Thank you, Peter. So uh, anyway, these numbers are still better by far than the performance most rural US customers can get today from ground-based or satellite internet services. Just ask, uh, I believe we have a member who lives up in New Hampshire and he lives in an area that does not get broadband. 
So he's got some terrible problems with uh, these issues. So you don't have to go very far to find an area on the ground that gets worse service than you would get from Starlink. That's Bob. Must, yeah. Uh, yeah. When you say low orbit, uh, how low is the low orbit? Three hundred miles. Feet. Did we say three hundred miles? No. Why are we uh, saying six feet? No, oh, it's not that low. <laughs> but low Earth orbit, I believe, is uh, around three hundred miles. Okay. Yeah. I, are the orbits? I don't know. You know, do they sell orbits or somebody regulates orbits? Yes. I, I don't know if it's NASA or if it's uh, the FCC, but somebody does regulate where communication satellites may be positioned and how many there can be and how, can, and how many can be at each node for geosynchronous, et cetera, et cetera. Doesn't that have to be yep. done internationally? Because, uh, you know, those are orbits are I, open to anybody. It may very well be that it is international these days. It used to be that the U.S. had its own, re own regulations for what we could do. Now, Charlie, you're probably right. There's some international agreement. I haven't really researched this, but yes, it's regulated. Because it's I know some years ago, Russia was trying to set up a alternate to or GPS. And so they were putting up satellites uh, yeah. and, and they want their own internet. So it must be regulated internationally, I would think. I'm guessing there are treaties. I'm guessing there are treaties, similar to the Antarctica Treaty. So uh, anyway, far better service than today we get from ground-based or satellite. So what comes next? As far as qualifying to compete for RDOF and the FCC's $16 billion, this looks very much like mission accomplished for SpaceX. Going forward, the company will be aiming to drive its lag rate, that's the latency, down below 20 milliseconds. Uh, and again, you can do better on ground-based while boosting its internet download speed toward one gigabit per second, which today is pretty good for even ground-based. Do you know how they go about uh, improving themselves from 31 to 20? I mean, even, you know, they're not changing any hardware, right? Yes, they are. They're putting more satellites up. So the distance of the handoff and the number of handoffs and the likelihood you'll have to hand off is reduced. Oh, that's the source of the lag, of course. The handoffs, as one of our group members just pointed out, getting a signal 300 miles down to earth takes very little time. Right. It's the processing each time it passes from satellite to satellite that takes the bulk of the time. Gotcha. Where's that, all this? Introduce, that introduces latency. Bob, where is this switching occurring? So that, you know, it, you know somewhere, somewhere some satellite has to know that it's going to pass it off to another satellite or it's going to push it to the downlink on that satellite. The satellites are in communication with ground stations, every one of the satellites. And uh, they are also in communication with each other. So they can autonomously communicate. I need to send a signal get ready for the signal, I'm ready to receive a signal. Those are simple right. things you can program into them. So, but it's a switching, it's a switching device that has to be part of, uh, part of the satellite, correct? The satellite yes. has to logically know that if I'm on one side of the earth and my, my destination is on the other side of the earth, right. I wanna go satellite to satellite as far as possible and then bring it down, as opposed to going up yeah. and down, up and down, up and down. Exactly. That's the kind of edge processing that is programmed in and hardware built into by uh, any kind of edge processing. And these satellites are doing the same thing. They do have switches. They are like an intelligent router in that regard, only more intelligent. They have a little bit of processing power. So they can okay. do some things autonomously. Right. Whereas so from more or less autonomous with, with probably, you know, some communication uh, going, going downwind. Yeah, I, the whole thing would be coordinated from the ground. You've probably answered this before, but yeah. um, how are they communicating? Are they doing it by, um, through lasers or what? I, there is laser communication. And yes, it was answered previously. Yeah, that's what I thought you said. Laser communication. Do you, know, do you know whether this is gonna pose a potential problem? I mean, laser beams do spread. 
and uh, you know, you're talking. You've talked about the what the astronomers are worried about. I would wonder whether we, whether these lasers in communication would start interfering with other systems too. I, as far as I know, there aren't very many things in orbit today that communicate satellite to satellite using lasers. The last no. thing. I, no, but there will be. Yes, and then we will have to do the same thing we do with any other airwaves or any other direct line of sight. Regulations and bands and paths which they can use. Just like airliners don't collide very often, they hardly ever, because their flight paths are centrally controlled and regulated. I believe that would probably have to happen in orbit. You would have to have a lot of regulation. And, and what about intelligence gathering? That is, what about listening in on each other's transmissions? That is entirely up to the discretion of the company which puts them up. They may wish to keep all this private, but as long as it's just Netflix, who cares? It's not government communication yet. The military has their I'll own- I'll send you a contract after the meeting for, uh, for access, okay? Okay. Uh, the military actually has its own network of satellites. Lots of secrecy about that, so I don't have details. So that's entirely different and that's secure. But this doesn't have to be. Well, and, it just seemed to me that with 12,000 satellites up there, you might be using some of them to listen in to the military and to the Russians and they likewise. Unnecessary. Our military has so many satellites of its own and they're better satellites than these for that purpose. And Charlie, they, I'm sure that, the, that uh, their communications are heavily encrypted. They certainly are, more heavily than anything uh, civilians have, and they have their own space shuttle. The uh, military has its own space shuttle. Uh, we, we have traditionally gathered information, encrypted or not, and saved it, hoping later to decrypt. Well, there's no reason you couldn't do that on these satellites. And we could do it on the Russian system. And the Chinese system, I'm sure China's going to do it. So anyway, over time, SpaceX hopes that these levels of performance will win it as many as 5 million broadband satellite internet customers in the U.S. That would mostly be rural areas. At a rumored monthly service cost of $80 per month, at least initially, times 12 months a year, Starlink therefore looks to be building toward about $4.8 billion of annual revenue for SpaceX. Not small potatoes. SpaceX president uh, in 2018 said it will cost the company about $10 billion or more to build out this network. Since the beginning of 2019, SpaceX has raised $1.7 billion in capital. So they have a ways to go. Is that really her last name? Yes, Chatla. <laughs> you should see some of the names that are in NASA. <laughs> And you should see that, oh, there's a name of a woman who uh, does illustrations. Uh, she's a graphic artist. And uh, she came up with the idea of, uh, of joke masks that had silly things on them. She came up with that idea 11 years before our pandemic, during the last pandemic, which was the swine flu in 2009. She was on Shark Tank and she got shot down so badly. But her name is interesting. I forget what the name is, but it, it's another one of these ironic names where she could not possibly have gone into any other industry. <laughs> anyway, so uh, this following stuff is copied directly from this URL, which is the reason I posted it. I, the recap is, let's just recap what we've got. SpaceX Starlink Internet I update. The internet seeks, uh, Starlink Internet seeks to solve the rural versus urban internet divide, which I have talked about. And it does look promising. Uh, it was supposed to get started August 10th. Oh, on August 10th, 2020, they were saying this. The estimated launch mid of the service, mid 2020, this has been delayed. The estimated cost, $80 per month, that's ongoing. The estimated equipment fees to set up your receiver is $100 to $300 one-time setup. 
That's a little expensive for equipment, but it's just once. Uh, this system does use a satellite dish, which does need permitting in some communities. Services like Starry for a fixed 5G internet to the home or business do not need a dish or other large exterior antenna. The whole building mast antennas are often used. Okay, now we are getting to stuff where we need to uh, stop recording the meeting because these are copyrighted videos. <laughs>